encapsulation is a good thing. And it's one reason why all semester long we haven't had to worry too much about what's really going on inside of vectors and lists. We've now seen what's going on behind the scenes of a vector. And we've also understood that because of encapsulation and because of abstractions presented by our standard collections, even if we do have some idea what's happening, so even if we understand that STD list is a linked list, we never actually have to worry about the minutia of maintaining linked lists. We can use push front and push back and pop front and pop back and iterators to work around um, having to deal with nodes and pointers. So the abstractions provided by the list type uh, allow us to avoid worrying about how lists are maintained internally. And that's good. And in general, as a programmer, when you need a data structure like a list or a vector, that's how you should do business. You create a data structure that exists already and just use it. You don't worry about what's happening behind the scenes. On the other hand, somebody has to write these things. Somebody has to write vectors and lists. And it's important, I think, to have some skills with implementing data structures from the inside. Not necessarily because all of you are going to go on to write the STD list type in some standard library, but because you might need a data structure someday that isn't as simple as just a list or a vector, and you might need to implement that yourself. So it's good to develop some dexterity with, for example, linked lists, which we're going to talk about today. Um, there's also one other thing, which is that there's one design pattern that we haven't spent very much time on in this course, and that is recursion. Uh, and you can think of recursion, you might recall from 111, as functions that call themselves. Recursion is wonderful. I love recursion. But I often feel that recursion isn't presented in a way that shows off all of its strengths. One place where I feel that recursion really pays off is working with linked lists. And that's because linked lists, I think, are inherently recursive data structures. So today, I'm going to write some code involving what I'm going to call raw linked lists. Linked lists that are just a bunch of nodes in a head pointer, not encapsulated inside some data structure. I'm going to write a bunch of functions that just work with nodes of lists. Um, and I'm going to start with two videos, this one and the next one, that do everything iteratively. So probably in the same way you use linked lists in CSC 111. And then in the two videos after that, I'm going to redo every operation with recursion. And I hope by the end of that to prove the point that recursion is beautiful and it saves us so much work over iterative solutions. And in some cases, there are things that we can only do with recursion, where the iterative solution would be absolutely nasty. But before we do that, let's work on the iterative solution. So the iterative solutions are not my favorites, but we can still write them. And it's always good to show what we can do with the knowledge that we have so far before we go dragging in new things. So I'll begin by talking about what is the usual way that we iterate over linked lists. This is something you might remember from 111, but suppose I want to walk through this singly linked list starting at the beginning, and I want to, let's say, print out each element, like what this print list function is doing here. What I would normally do is create a new pointer that I can use, because I don't want to modify the head pointer, because I obviously want the list to remain unchanged as I print it. I'll make a new pointer, I'll just call it node, and I'll set the pointer to point to the first node of the list. I'll make it a copy of the head pointer. So that's what I'm doing here. And then I'm going to walk along the list. I'll work with each node. Um, I'll look at its element, for example. When I'm done with a node, I will set my node pointer to equal the next pointer of whatever node I was already working with. OK, so now it's this. I work with the element. I then set the node pointer to be the next pointer of this node. So now node points to this. I work with the element. Um, I set the, next, the, the node pointer to be the next pointer of this node, which in this case is null. And then I'll, I'll make sure I stop as soon as the, node that I'm, the pointer I'm working with, this variable node, is equal to null. So the loop keeps going as long as node is not equal to the null pointer. And at each step, it sets the value of node to equal the next pointer of whatever it currently points to. OK, that is the broad, I guess, pattern we tend to use to iterate over linked lists. We might use a for loop. We might use a while loop. My goal in this video is to write a bunch of functions that work with lists iteratively. Um, OK, so I'll just get rid of this for now. And then I'll go down to main and show off the testing code that I have. Um, there are several parts to main, and I'm only going to get to the end of part C in this video. The next video will cover uh, parts, uh, will cover what, part D um, and E. Ooh, whoops, that's a typo. So uh, what I want to begin with is these two functions that I've already written. And I guess I just showed off print list, but I didn't show off insert at front. The insert at front function takes a head pointer. Notice that it takes it by reference, because adding something to the front of a list obviously modifies the head pointer. And then the, the function adds a brand new node at the beginning of the list. Um, this is a similar function to the one we wrote two videos ago in our stack class. Um, and then I've got print list, which I already showed off. Um, I'm going to begin by just testing those two out. So in main, in part A, I 
add a bunch of elements to the front of my list, um, this results in the same list I have over on the right. So because I add six and then I add two elements before it, six ends up at the end of my list. And so my list is 17, 10, and six. So I'll try compiling this. Um, we get these warnings, they are harmless for now. All they're telling us is that we haven't written some of these functions, which makes sense because obviously I haven't done the video yet. Um, of course, these warnings would be serious if I thought that I was done. Um, okay, iterative raw list one, we can see it prints out L1, which is 17, 10, and then six. Okay, so in this video, I want to get to the end of part C. So I'll begin in part B, writing this function insert at end. Notice that what it wants to do is insert the number 10 three times at the end of the list. Okay, before we do that, let's go and try and write the function. So insert at end. I, I give you the head pointer of the list. I say, please add the, the value I provided to the end of the list. But that's weird. If I'm inserting at the end, why does the head pointer need to be passed by reference? I mean, why would I need to modify the beginning of a list if I'm inserting at the end? That's a good question. So um, suppose I want to insert at the end of this list, an empty list. Well, inserting at the end will require modifying the head pointer because I'm also inserting at the beginning if the list is empty. Now, there's a few ways of handling that. I'm going to be pragmatic and avoid reinventing the wheel. I'm going to say, wait a minute. If you've asked me to insert at the end of an empty list, if the head pointer is null, then I'm also inserting at the beginning of that list. And my friend upstairs, the insert at front function, seems to be pretty good at inserting at the beginning of lists. So I'll just tell, I'll just have it take care of this. Um, so I, I hand it the head pointer and the value and I say, yeah, insert at the front and then I'm done. Done. So insert at end is a bit is just going to freeload off of insert at front in the case where the list is empty. That means that if I get past line 52, so as of line 53, um, I can assume that the list always contains one legitimate node. And then therefore it becomes, I guess, a much more streamlined problem. So what I'm going to want to do to insert at the end, I guess I'm going to need a new node. Suppose I'm inserting the value 187. Well, then I'll need to make up a brand new node with the value 187. What's the next pointer of my new node going to be? Well, because when I'm done, this will be the end of my list, I guess my next pointer will be null. Okay, that's my first step. So I'll make a new node. Okay, and I call make shared to create the node object. And this creates a node, and then I give it my head pointer, and then I give it the, the um, oh wait, I don't give my head pointer. I, the next pointer of my new node will be null, and the value uh, will be the value that was passed in by the caller. All right, so as of line 54, I've made my new node. There it is. It's all ready to be the last node of the list, but it's not yet. What I have to do now is go find the current last node of the list and connect it up to the node that I just created. Okay, so I guess I'll make a variable, a pointer, that will eventually point to my last node. And for the time being, I'll just set it to be the, the head pointer while I work on finding my last node. So here's my pointer, last node. Currently, it points to head. What I would like to do is walk this pointer along until I get to the last node of the list. I don't want to go too far. I don't want to go until last node equals null because that wouldn't tell me anything. I want last node to point to a legitimate node object that is the last node of the list, which means what I should do is start at the beginning and just walk along until I find it. Okay, but when will I have found it? What unique property does the last node of the list have that no other node has? Well, I guess the last node of the list will be the only node of the list whose next pointer is equal to null. So I'm going to keep walking this pointer along until I find a node whose next pointer is equal to null. So I'll say, okay, while last node arrow next is not equal to null, well, if the null, if next pointer isn't null, then this is not the last node. So I'll just walk the pointer along. Last node equals last node arrow Next, notice the odd format of the loop condition. Unlike the loop condition up above, where we were keep we, we just kept going until the node pointer itself equaled null. Here we are stopping when the next pointer of the node equals null. I don't want to. I don't want last node the pointer last node to equal null. I want it to point to something whose next pointer is null. Um, and then we can just walk it along just to show that off. So on line 54, I start in this situation here, and then I enter the loop. I ask the question: Is last node arrow next equal to null? So this is what last node currently points to. Its next pointer is not equal to null. So the loop keeps going. Last node equals last node arrow next. Okay, so we do this. All right, is the next pointer of this equal to null? No, so the loop keeps going. Last node equals last node arrow next. Is the next pointer of this equal to null? Yes, and so the loop ends. And so as of line 58, I should assume that my variable last node does indeed point to the very last node of the list. Because I know, because I got to line 53, that there is at least one node of the list. 
Now what I'll do is I'll set the next pointer of my previously last node um, to be the node that I just created. And I'll end up in this situation. So I've just taken the next pointer of this thing last node and set it to point down here. All right. And now my new node that I just created is the last node of the list. Okay, and so I can throw away my pointer last node, but that'll happen automatically because the function is about to end. And so we'll try testing that. And we'll scroll down to main to take a look at the testing code. So again, the compiler is giving us all these warnings. It's good to always scroll up and look because there could have been an error before those warnings. If we're not careful, we might miss an error. But it looks like here there was no problem. Um, okay, and so I'll try running it again. And here the list is going to be 17, 10, 6, and then 10, and then three elements, uh, th three times the element 10. I guess I should duplicate that on my diagram. Uh, so I'll just erase the 187. And we will just add three copies of the, uh, a node containing the element 10. Okay, so there's one copy, 10, 10, and the last one here. There we go, and then the, then the six points into that. And so now my diagram reflects the list as apparently it is uh, its current state after the end of part B. There is a reason I chose to use the number 10 here. Um, it may not be obvious now, but trust me, when we get to part C, you'll see why. Um, okay, so I want to write part C. So I think I've written insert at end. I suppose maybe a little bit more testing might be helpful to verify that insert at end works on an empty list. Um, but in the interest of brevity, we won't do that in the video. So now I want to write these other two functions, count elements and sum list. They're both very similar. One of them is to iterate through the list and add up the element in each node. The other one is just to iterate through the list and count off how many nodes I find. Um, and so what I'm going to want to write these two functions, there they are here, I'm going to want some way of iterating over the entire list. And really, I could just cannibalize this loop I already have, and I'm going to. And I, I think this is realistic because on an open book exam, the kind that you're going to write, um, you are also allowed to bring in notes and use code in your notes as inspiration. So here I have a, I have a loop that iterates over every node of the list. It starts with the head pointer. It keeps walking as long as the node pointer isn't null. And at each step, it sets the node pointer to point to the next node in the sequence. What I would like to do is just add up how many nodes I find. So I'll say I'll create an integer value called count. And then every node I hit, I'll do count plus plus. Right, and so then when I'm done, I'll return the count. And then I feel like this was simple enough that I could probably adapt this to be the, to compute the sum of the list pretty easily. So I say int um, sum. The elements are all ints, so I should use int to store the sum. At each step, I say sum plus equals node arrow element. And then at the end, I return the sum. Um, now, just an editorial point. Um, I know from years of experience that 17 plus 10 plus 6 is 33. So I, so I should expect the sum of this whole list should be 63 and that there are six elements. So we'll try running that. Um, again, the warnings, because we haven't written these two functions yet, we will do that in the next video. Um, and then here we can see prints out the list. There are six elements. The sum of the elements is 63. And so I used a very similar protocol for all of the functions that I wrote here, which is uh, for these two, I used a for loop, but I could have used a while loop. I start, uh, I have to iterate along the list by using a, a pointer variable that I create, a temporary pointer variable that just walks along um, and is set to the next pointer of each node as we walk along. And I use some condition to decide when I'm done. When I'm iterating over the entire list, I keep going until my pointer node is equal to null. If I'm searching for something, so I'm looking for the last node of the list, my condition might be different. This is one more reason why when you work with linked lists, it's good to have a diagram over on the side and to play with it as you write your code. Because the loop condition you need may not always be the same. There isn't really some cookie cutter loop that works for all linked list code. Okay, so in the next video, what I want to write are these two functions copy and filter. Unlike the functions we already wrote, they don't just work with single elements, they create copies of either the entire list or some subset of the list.